run over my two minutes. I'm so sorry, Christine. No, it's okay. And yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So as we're getting her slides come up, um, Christine Ace is um, works in women's health at Oregon Health and Sciences University. She is a alumni of Oregon State. Um, advanced training in the area of diabetes. She does have a WIC connection um, in the past. Um, I saw WIC participants up at OHSU. Um, according to your profile on your bio, Christy, you're passionate about good health. Um, but let's see, many women put out themselves on the back burner. So while she, uh, uh, you are passionate about diabetes education, especially gestational diabetes, so take it away. All right. So I always say that I would probably not have gotten my job at OHSU if not for my WIC jobs that I got when I first finished my internship. So I'm a native Portlander, did my internship in Dallas, Texas, and I was like, well, that was fun for a year, but Portland, here I come. And um, early 90s, uh, used to use a lot of on-call WIC dietitians, um, for those of you who have been around a long time like me, and I had the best mentors. Like first off, just the clinics that I worked at, um, Jennifer Young and Krista Hawkins and, you know, Ellen Bartholomew, you know, was our boss. And it was just the best experience for a brand new dietetic, you know, um, person and great mentors got to go around to all the weight clinics. It was such a great experience. And that's where I really was like my love of OB nutrition, you know, was planted. And then OHSU had this position open for a women's health clinic dietitian. I was like, well, this feels a lot like the WIC clinic, you know, and they, the doctors must have liked me, saw a lot of energy. Um, and at that point, we had a half day diabetes and pregnancy clinic. Even back in 1993, it was mainly type one diabetics with some gestationals thrown in there. Uh, little did I know that this would become such a big part of my career, diabetes and pregnancy. And so I, when I do slides, I kind of throw in too many. So definitely if, if people want to hear more about certain things or I might skip through just to be, um, you know, respectful of your guys' time, but we're going to focus on gestational diabetes because 90% of all diabetes and pregnancy is gestational diabetes. While type 2 and type 1 confer higher risk for both moms and babies, the majority of diabetes and pregnancy is gestational. And it's, we have now, just to kind of explain, so I do a lot of high risk OB as my focus in the Center for Women's Health at OHSU. And we have um, one day um, that's just specifically for diabetes and pregnancy with a maternal fetal medicine doctor, residents, um, me um, as the dietitian diabetes educator, a nurse, and we're going to start having a physician's assistant too who's going to help manage insulin pumps and CGMs because we're really starting to do more of that. Um, so it's a very um, great, you know, multidisciplinary clinic. But then I also see within our own Center for Women's Health, we have a lot of providers who see regular OB patients. And so I get a lot of just gestational diabetics who are A1, lifestyle control, not requiring medications. And then our high risk clinic is a little bit of a mix mash of those patients that originate within the Center for Women's Health or family medicine or other providers at OHSU. And then we get outside referrals. So we get referrals from salute patients, Woodburn, um, Tillamook, uh, Legrand, all around Oregon for doctors who don't feel comfortable managing high risk type 1 or type 2 diabetic patients or who might be needing to deliver at OHSU for multiple reasons. So it's a consult clinic as well, might be a one time only visit. So it's kind of a variety of things. But, um, you know, their gestational diabetes is not without controversy. It never has been. Even back in the 90s, I worked with doctors who didn't think it was a real disease. And I think at this point, we've accumulated enough evidence that it is a real thing in pregnancy, whether we call it gestational diabetes or something else. There's not quite everything normal going on with this pregnancy that confers increased risk for both mom and baby if it's not managed. And so I think it's interesting how there's different definitions and what I think is interesting most about the recent diabetes care clinical practice guidelines is that basically the diabetes association is saying that we should not be calling people who are diagnosed in the first trimester with gestational diabetes and we do at OHSU because there's nothing else to call them at this point it's a gray area where people pregnant women come into pregnancy with not totally normal glucose 
tolerance or their fastings might be impaired, but they don't actually have real diabetes either. So they're technically pre-diabetes, but we don't call them that because then we can't bill their insurance for managing their gestational diabetes. We can't bill their insurance for test strips and you know, Lancet and all of that and medication if they require it. So, so there's, you know, kind of interesting, you know, differences in there. And as somebody who has to bill for her services, we, you know, I find it very important to have actual, a patient who meets actual clinical criteria, right, for the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. So we have a doctor who's actually proposing a study that's going to be like the HAPO trial, which I'll, try, I'll talk to you about in a minute, but that's going to start in the first trimester. So we're going to have women pregnant women with continuous glucose monitors starting in the first trimester. So we can help elucidate where in that first trimester are normal blood sugars in pregnancy, which we don't really know. Where does increased risk start happening as blood sugars, you know, progress in a linear relationship with outcomes? So that's what's interesting to me more about that slide. We know that gestational diabetes is increasing because it mirrors the other things that are increasing around the world, obesity. Um, there's a huge range there, you know, depending on the population you look at, how patients are actually tested for gestational diabetes matters. Um, you know, I would say our OHSU prevalence is about 14%. Um, for us because we also use a, the type two, we use the one step process. So we diagnose more patients that way than a two step process. Um, but, you know, it's definitely increasing. Um, we know that we're working with a less healthy population for women of reproductive age. You know, that also mirrors the worsening, you know, health of our American adult population where we have one or more you know, what half of all American adults walking around with one or more preventable chronic diseases. So women of reproductive age are not immune to this. And so we're seeing more women coming into pregnancy with obesity, hypertensive disorders, fatty liver disease, um, impaired fasting, prediabetes, you know, all sorts of things. And so, um, you know, if, even if they don't have real diabetes, gestational <coughs> diabetes confers increased risk for those pregnancies for both mom and baby, and you can see both of those. But also outside of pregnancy, increased risk for real diabetes for, for the mom, increased lifetime risk 60% over the next 10 years will develop type 2 diabetes for women who have history of GDM, and then for the offspring, those babies exposed to gestational diabetes in utero are at high risk for themselves to, to be obese or have um, type 2 diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases as well. So it's a real thing. Um, and I know we can all agree in this room that, new, and out to those listening, that nutrition would be in the center of this circle, right? That all the stages of our life, nutrition is important. They're all connected and that if you get off track any one stage, it can really impact the next stage, but also for just the health of families, optimizing the health of women is super important. And we all play a super important role, whether it's sharing our knowledge, which is you know why I love coming to things like this, because I learned it's a two-way street to learn from each other. How do we optimize resources for our patients? How do I get more of my patients in the WIC? If you are gonna be, I wish you know that um, you guys were seeing these gestational diabetics more. That's one, I mean, I have selfish reason for sharing my knowledge too, um, because right now what I see that they're seeing nurses, which is great, but not always, you know, as in-depth knowledge level that we have. Um, and so we're, you know, preaching to the choir on this. Um, what we know is that women, especially pregnant women, um, are underrepresented in the data that compiles, you know, the dietary guidelines reports and, and also babies and children under age two, which hopefully will change around with the next um, report. But we can pretty much assume, you know, that women of reproductive age diets are similar, you know, to, to this um, under consumption of the nutrient dense foods and over consumption of foods that while they might taste delicious, really don't have a lot of redeeming nutritional value. And unfortunately, this typical Western diet, pre-pregnancy and early in pregnancy is a risk factor for developing gestational diabetes because of the added sugars and saturated fats and uh, does not help the body meet that challenge of pregnancy very successfully is how I like to phrase it. And so, you know, I think I like that idea that I saw with Cheryl talking about what are some reasons why patients who are in WIC should get referred to a dietitian early, right? Earlier in pregnancy, 
if they have a high risk, if they're, you know, history of gestational diabetes for sure, or prediabetes, or even elevated lipids, um, you'll see that those are things that are modifiable that can help, you know, break this cycle, right? Um, and so, obviously, your race is not modifiable, your genetics, your age, uh, but things like uh, your BMI, potentially, if you're preconception, um, or things like if you see a patient who has high lipids or HDL is um, low and their LDL is high and they have high triglycerides, that's metabolic syndrome. Um, if they have abdominal obesity or potential other things like fatty liver, we don't obviously get the chance to look for inflammatory markers in the first trimester. There's lots of other metabolic factors are looking at being tied for risk of GDM. But, um, and then certain lifestyle habits, um, two that are like the typical Western diet I mentioned are hopefully modifiable. Um, so generally, you, we have universal screening here where all women are screened around 24 to 28 weeks um, and two-step approach. And just, I mean, I have been around the block because we have used like four different ways of screening for gestational diabetes in my 25 years at OHSU. So um, we've, with the old, the old school way and the up-to-date way, so even if you do a three-hour test, there's different criteria that, that places might use to help diagnose gestational diabetes. Um, so generally, it's the Carpenter Q stand, the lower cutoffs that are used if, if people are doing the two-step process. Um, but, but what really helped us, OHSU, and lots of other places changed the one-step process is the HAPO trial. So not to bore you guys to death, but this was a seminal trial that really showed, well, the purpose, the question it wanted to answer really is out, you know, side of true real diabetes, where does maternal risk and fetal risk start increasing as blood sugars increase in pregnancy? So 25,000 women around the world were given, blinded, they, were take, they took the glucose test, the two-hour glucose tolerance test, and providers were blinded unless they were definitely uh, real diabetes. Um, and then they plotted all of those glucose test results um, on a curve and looked at primary outcomes and secondary outcomes, as you can see. And the interesting thing is that um, there was no obvious threshold for ri where risk increased. And that's what doctors were disappointed. They wanted to be able to say gestational diabetes happens right here, which wasn't shown. It was a linear relationship um, with maternal glucose and increased birth weight as macrosomia was the big one, um, cord blood serum C peptide, um, which is an indication of fetal beta cell function, um, and then the other primary and secondary outcomes. What was interesting too is that the fasting blood sugar, with, as it increased in pregnancy, was the most associated blood sugar with macrosomia. Um, so that was super interesting with the HAPO trial and that the one hour um, also was very important. So that's why when we do a glucometer, um, we do the fasting in the one hour after each meal because those are the most associated with macrosomia if they're not optimized in pregnancy. And normal, we also found that normal fastings in pregnancy run in the 70s to low 80s. So while the glucose tolerance test, you know, you can get ruled in with a fasting of 92, it's not even close to prediabetes, right, which is a fasting of 100, but is it nowhere, is it normal for a pregnant woman to be in the 90s for their fastings? Um, so we do, we actually screen all of our pregnant women in the first trimester. If they have one risk factor, they're, they're encouraged to do a hemoglobin A1C, which is not perfect, but it helps us decide then if they need the two-hour glucose test in the first trimester. So if their hemoglobin A1C is 5.7, um, or above, below 6.5, which would be real diabetes, then they are encouraged to do the early glucose tolerance test. That's that gray area I was talking about where they're not really, they're not diabetes, they're not normal, but they're somewhere in the middle. They're probably pre-diabetic, but we can't really call them pre-diabetic either. At this point, we don't really know what to call them. So then we do the glucose test. And if they have one out of those three cutoffs in the blue, then they're called gestational diabetic um, early in pregnancy. They're just given that diagnosis. A lot of providers want to call them type two, but they're not type two. That's the thing that I see a lot. People get nervous and they want to over prescribe the diagnosis of type two as well. Say they have an A1C of 6.4 and they freak out and they're like, 
no, that's not diabetes, right? And so um, there's a lot even just amongst doctors that they don't know really what to do with all of this information. Um, so if their A1C is below 5.7, then they're not gestational, they're not real diabetes, and then they go on with pregnancy in around 24, 25 weeks, they get to do the glucose test again. Um, and we can, providers can diagnose type 2 diabetes in pregnancy now if they're at 6.5 or above, or they have fasting above 126, or oh, basically the two hour needs to be above 200. Okay. So here's just to show you where the drama never ends with this um, diabetes and pregnancy stuff. So the HAPO trial came out. We were all like, oh, okay, this is going to convince everybody that worldwide we should be doing the same testing because then we can collect better data and really figure this out a little bit better. What approaches, what treatment, what is the best way, you know, to, to manage gestational diabetes and improve outcomes? Well, that didn't happen. Um, a lot of groups believe different things. Um, the IAD, PSG um, were the ones that is a big international kind of specialty group on gestational diabetes and pregnancy. They really encouraged and proposed everybody to to move to the two-hour one-step process. Um, the Diabetes Association was pretty supportive of that, but the ACOG, which is the obstetrics, you know, big society, they're more conservative and really were not supportive of that because of lots of different, you know, points. There are some good points on that. Um, you know, some of it was there's a lot of anxiety with a gestational diabetes diagnosis, which we'll talk about. Do, do all places around the country have resources for diabetes education? Um, you know, does, have we proved that even intervention even does anything to improve outcomes? There's a lot of that discussion too. So it's really been going back and forth for all these years. And even like I would say about some places, um, I'll give like Virginia Garcia an example. They came along with us and changed to the two hour glucose tolerance test. And then providers were kind of starting to get less convinced with some of the evidence that was coming out. They went back to the three hour um, glucose tolerance test. But now they're thinking about going back to the two hour because they realize that the two step is also a painful process. If somebody doesn't pass the one hour, then they have to go do another huger amount of glucose, right? So there is, it's still very imperfect is what I'm trying to say. And you, who, depending on, you guys come from all different counties around the state, probably that many different types of ways of um, being their patients, pregnant women are getting screened or looked at or evaluated for risk for gestational diabetes. Um, so, um, you know, I gave a talk at the Northwest Review last fall that was really what I'm noticing more and more is that it's not the diagnosis that's so bad, it's the perception of it, right? And that we need to help women look at it in a different way and sell it as an opportunity because um, that's what it really is and that we have an opportunity to make this process more effective for our patients and more, I wouldn't say enjoyable, but less of a big deal. Um, right. And that, and this gets along with that. Every, all of us are definitely trying to move towards, um, uh, individualized counseling that is, is more supportive, right. And individualized and supporting a woman's confidence and confidence in her ability to feed her body, right. And trust her instincts. And that is how we're going to evoke healthier behaviors. Right. So I feel like, um, it's a big bummer for patients. Um, and that if you're taking this on as to be a diabetes educator, um, it's super important to, to build up your skills for how to um, help patients manage, like just take that on, right? Talk about their thoughts and feelings about it um, and then how to process those and then move on. Because it's unfortunately in pregnancy, they have a short window to start taking action, right? Um, and so these are all of the things that I hear from my patients um, about, you know, what they're feeling. Um, but again, you know, really encouraging them. And I think that the most important thing that I phrase this as, like the things that we want patients to do to help their blood sugars and manage their gestational diabetes are the things that are good for all of our pregnant patients because pregnancy is a challenge to the body and all pregnant women are having some insulin resistance, you know, some, you know, carb intolerance by the third trimester, everybody's body's making three times more insulin than they were making prior to pregnancy. And so your lifestyle choices can help your body meet that challenge of pregnancy or make it more difficult. And so I think like almost blaming the pregnancy hormones is, is one way of doing this because women are like, oh, I feel so guilty. I feel so bad. And they're not thinking about 
what is actually going on in their body physiologically that's making this a big challenge. And it can be a way of thinking about their choices in that way, right? So, um, and that pregnancy is a long haul. 40 weeks is a long haul and everybody's like, you know, motivation to eat really good dims, you know, around that 30 B mark. So some feel like it's kind of a blessing after all um, to have extra reasons, right? To do the things that is good for all of us to do to take care of our bodies. So, um, and I think, um, you know, it's a way to practice compassion versus the guilt stuff, right? Um, and that they can learn new things. I learn new things from my patients all the time. And that we want what they want, which is as healthy baby's body as possible, right? And so talking about how um, sugar is just one source of fuel that crosses the placenta, um, you know, that can give their baby's body too much extra fuel, but also then attendant consequences of being too worried about your food and restricting your diet too much um, is also not great. So we'll talk about that as we move along. There's other fuels that can serve as an overgrowth factor for babies, for fetuses as well. Um, so it gives us more ammo for this balanced approach, you know, for eating to manage diabetes and pregnancy. Um, and also it gives women a glimpse into their future, like if they aren't continuing to make themselves a priority, at, even after having children to take care of themselves, eat, you know, mostly good food that they're higher risk to get type 2 diabetes. Um, so first intervention is to modify diet. 90% of women with gestational diabetes are lifestyle managed, and that early referral is super important. Within a week of diagnosis is, is the standard of care. Um, so that would be one of those ones, you know, if WIC dietitians were going to start doing this, that, that early high-risk referral would be super great. Um, and then we'll talk about medication if you guys are interested. Um, so again, as somebody who has to bill for all of my visits, for me, this is the one time where pretty much regardless of insurance, they cover for the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. There's a few interesting plans out there that I've come across in the last week or two where they will not cover it unless they're younger than age 19, which is ridiculous. Also, TRICARE insurance, which is basically our military personnel, does not cover for nutrition counseling for any diagnosis at all, which is really, so you can get me fired up talking about insurance. So I think your jobs are a lot better <laughs> than mine where I have to bill for my services, but it's just the fact of most of our lives who work in clinical outpatient setting, we have to bill. Um, so for me, at least, I know that it's covered without like all of those crazy other things that insurance tries to do to get out of covering. Um, and you know, the, the goal again is not just about, you know, lowering blood sugars, right? These are pregnant women. So we need to make sure they have a high quality diet um, that'll promote optimal fetal growth, maternal health, and achieve blood sugar goals. And it all works together, right? And if we, control blood sugars, but we don't look at weight gain, then we see large amounts of LGA as well in the type ones, type twos, and gestational diabetics. So, so they, the big picture is all those lifestyle behaviors are important to optimize all parts of pregnancy. Um, and so again, have we come, how far have we really come since the nineties when I first practiced as far as dietary evidence for best optimizing blood sugars in pregnancy a little bit far but maybe not as much as as we would hope so um i think it's an important thing to clarify since we are seeing more and more of it and we don't want unintended consequences right of thinking we're doing well with one area like say prescribing a low carb diet but unintended consequences of a high fat diet are actually real um and we'll look at that but um, typically, the conventional GDM diet has been carb restricted to 30, 40 percent, which seems lots when you're talking about the keto diet that everybody wants to follow right now. Um, I don't know if you guys are getting that with, yeah, pre-pregnancy and pregnancy. Uh, proteins usually held relatively um, constant, and then so the kind of unintentional factor of that is you get more fat in the diet, which is a concern. Um, because we know that high fat diets increase maternal insulin resistance, which is already increased in pregnancy. And if a woman has pre existing high triglycerides or fatty liver and things, that can make that metabolic system worse. Um, but also, dietary fats can be hydrolyzed to free fatty acids, which get transported across the, to the placenta as well and can serve as an excess source of fuel for, for the fetus, um, too. So that's why when you optimize blood sugars um, with 
carbs, you don't always see the translation into healthy bod baby's body because there could be other things doing, you know, programming that child to be too big, other dietary factors. Um, so it does seem to help to um, do a euglycemic diet for the management of gestational diabetes, and it does seem to, to help and or to be safe. Um, so generally, I counsel my patients that it's normal to sort of lose a little bit of weight or stay the same after because they're also being more mindful of their choices. Sometimes their diet was a bit higher in carb than you might recommend, have good blood sugar. So we know there's a little bit of a diuretic effect when you eat less carbs for the first week or two. But really, it shouldn't be where they're feeling hungry or deprived or that sort of a thing. Um, so what resor resources are there out there for you guys? Um, the Academy just revised its practice guideline for GDM um, in 2016. There was a lot of recommendations in there, so this is just a reminder slide to go check that out. Um, but that it's important, they encourage balanced macronutrients, which is great, individualized, of course, um, and that the dietary studies were not usually that great of quality, and it was hard to compare because there was a lot of variability within studies as well. Um, and they did not um, address maternal high fat diet in that. Um, so also sweet success. So that's been around a long time. We had that information back in the early 90s. They have some good online um, dietary information. It is a little bit more on that carb restriction side of things, but it's got some other good information too. And then ADA every year um, comes out with standard practice uh, standard guidelines and they have specific pregnancy diabetes position paper that I think is worth reading if this is a field of study or practice that you're interested in. This is what the sweet success dietary handout looks like. Um, and it used to be available in a trifold and you could buy it, but now you can't buy it. You can just print it off with a color printer um, free from their website. And I think it's really great in that um, I like how it has you have um, breakfast. That first box over on the left-hand side is breakfast and then it has snack. And if you open that page over, you'd have lunch, snack, dinner, snack. So you can outline specific ideas for meals and snacks, but you can talk about basic carb counting using this and vegetables and then it has the protein, the fats, and it has unsaturated and saturated and the high sugar type stuff. So I like it as a teaching tool. I think it's a good one if you're looking for one. Um, so some of this is redundant. Um, so in animal studies, um, because it's unethical to study low carb, too low carb in pregnancy, right? But in animal studies, um, it looks like a low carb, high fat diet is not great for, for fetal brain development, also programs fetal growth to be small at birth and then have increased cardiometabolic risk as a off, in the offspring. So fetal programming is happening in a negative way. Um, but also there's been some anecdotal um, evidence in human pregnancies that it is does compromise fetal brain development um, as well. So keto and too low is definitely not recommended in pregnancy. We don't really know what the, I always tell my patients, I don't know what the safest, the lowest amount of carbs is in pregnancy, but we'll, I'll go over the, remind you, you guys probably already know this, the daily recommended intake. But this is a study that challenges the idea that traditional low carb is the way to go. So this is a group out of Denver. Um, they do a lot of research on gestational diabetes. This was a really interesting feeding study. It was a very small study that didn't last very long, but they did a the choice diet, which was, you can see it, high carb, 60% carb, 25% protein, 25% fat compared to traditional. Um, because of this concern that they're seeing in their studies with um, high fat diets worsening um, maternal insulin resistance and promoting excess fetal fat accretion in the offspring. Um, and the, what they found is that women follow the choice diet Again, feeding study, right? So it was a, a good diet. It wasn't like super fancy, pantsy, but it was good, good food. Um, but they had just as good of control with their blood sugars, lower free fatty acids, improved insulin action, less inflammation, um, and potentially less excess infant adiposity and maternal insulin resistance. So they also found that patients adhere to it better. Um, it was easier to do and more enjoyable and more culturally sensitive. There's a lot of cultures that eat a higher carb diet, right? 
um, ethnically a really good diet, right? High quality carbs often. So I think that's a very important point there. Um, and it may also help further uh, minimize further gestational weight gain. So this study is being followed out. Um, they're kind of tracking more um, and hopefully we'll continue to publish their, their data on that. Um, so I think to keep in mind that there's daily recommended intakes for, for carbs, but again, you know, it's kind of debatable about the solidness of the evidence that this data comes from, but in the first trimester, 135 or 130 grams minimum for carbs. So if I'm seeing a preconception woman who wants to eat a low carb diet, I at least have her do what's recommended for the first trimester. And then 175 grams in the second and third, which is actually, if you look at percentage based for on calories is low. Like if you look at what's low carb in the diet studies for GDM, they're over, they're about 200 or above for total carbs. If you're eating like a 2200 calorie diet or whatever it is. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then um, breakfast, so there's a couple things I think once you work with pregnant women and you look at a gazillion amounts of blood sugars like I have, you realize, wow, this is true. Women are more carb intolerant at breakfast when they're pregnant. So it does help to have less carbs at breakfast. Yes, milk, cereal, fruit at breakfast tends to make blood sugars go higher. So why not just think about, we're not saying they're not good, right? We're just saying, let's think about how your body's working and how you could eat these foods in a different way or different time of day just to help your body work better. No big deal, right? We're not saying anything is particularly bad or, or not good, but it does seem to work better to have 15 to 30 grams of solid, like whole grain type bread with more protein. Go to reason eat eggs, right? Get the choline from the yolks um, or the nut butter or whatever it is, throw in some avocado with your egg. Um, so I like to kind of um, talk about specific recommendations, but in light of the challenge of pregnancy, right? Because then it's less on that person, like, oh, your body's not working well. No, that's not what it's all about, right? And to use the glucometer super important information, they're gonna go to all that work poking their finger. We need to put value on the data, right? That the glucometer is not telling them if they're good or bad, if their choice is good or bad. It's how is that choice working for me right now or not given the challenge of pregnancy? That's a better way to filter that information, right? And whenever do we get concrete feedback from that? Otherwise you're just shooting in the dark, right? You don't really know if your body's handling something or not without that information. Um, it does, and like all pregnant women, it seems to help if they eat regular meals and snacks, you know, on a regular schedule. The body seems to like that in pregnancy because hormones are kind of the, the unknown variable that really makes it a challenge. Fruit seems to work better to have for snacks rather than with meals, even at lunch or too close to dinner. It might make the blood sugars go a bit higher. Um, we know that calcium rich foods are important, right? So it's assessing what a person likes to eat, what they have, do they have any holes in their diet? Filling those, it gives me opportunity if I haven't met this person before to go through all the pregnancy things, you know, making sure they're hitting all the high points. It does seem difficult to achieve blood sugar goals in pregnancy if people are consuming juice juice um, and soda and, you know, foods that are high in sugar and processed carbs. But then again, what's the recommendations for all pregnant women to have a handle on that, right? Not that they can't have a treat here and there, but what's a reasonable amount and when is it best handled by the body? Probably in the afternoon if you're looking at glucose tolerance. So that's where I talk to my patients about if they're really having strong cravings for treats and sweets, what is it they really want? And could they maybe do that in the afternoon? You know, and that would include cereal for me. I kind of think of cereal as dessert for how it affects blood sugars. And so it seems to work better if they think of it like an afternoon snack versus with breakfast or at bedtime, because it will make the fasting high too, is something that I've seen. So we'll drink in a glass of milk at night. Um, so real quick, I'd like, I could see some really nice food list discussion around that in terms yeah. of, of breakfast and what the WIC cereal is more of a snack time in, in the afternoon. So I think that- Or try oatmeal. Yeah. Yeah. So and add the protein. That's the thing. Like, can they put a little peanut butter in their oatmeal or have nuts on the side or an egg on the side? Those are ways to make that one work about half the time. And that's an example of, it's not necessarily that it's not a good choice. It's just that- we either eat it in a way where it's really heavy carbs or we, yeah, don't add enough protein or that it may just not work right there. 
because I just when you talked about oatmeal, you mean that like the whole grain cereals are yeah. going to be better. Yeah, so even sometimes those the whole grain pieces that the whole grain cereals. They can try it, and that's what the nice our wick cereals. Having them in as an afternoon, that's what I was hearing. Yeah. Is that more of an afternoon snack? Yeah. Well, you said unless you use something like oatmeal or something. Right. Like right. I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah, but yeah, the cold cereal, cereal is probably not going to work. Like yeah, that shoot them up. Shoot right, up. right, right. So, because yeah. a lot of my patients will say, but it says no sugar. But the problem is, is we take something that's a whole grain and we pulverize it in the dust and we form it into shapes and it has a really high glycemic index. And it's hard to eat a small serving. And if you, I mean, truly, I look at, I'm probably reviewing 30 patients' blood sugars every week. And I hardly see anybody that can have good blood sugars after they eat cereal in the morning. So, it's, it's just the way it is. And it's not to say anything bad about the WIC program. I love the WIC program, but it's there may be a better time to have that. And um, yeah, so something to think about. What did you say about milk in the evening? So milk at bedtime, I see a lot of my like Hispanic patients sometimes will, will come in and they'll tell me that they're having a bowl of cereal or a glass of milk at night and they have high fastings. And I don't think it's fair to them to not um let them know that that isn't necessarily the best choice right because of their blood sugar so if they're going to start insulin i want them to try something that actually is going to work for them so moving that to a different time of day not a big deal and then trying a snack at night that is more protein style so they eat dinner at a good time uh, making sure it's not too late and then they have a protein type snack at bedtime that's lower in carbs and that and then maybe some cardio or strength resistance training really seems to help the fasting blood sugars because that's a different um scenario that's going on in the body it's more about optimizing liver function that's there's gut um lipid um reactions in the body and blood sugar like glucose management reactions that really are optimal only when our circadian rhythm is kind of all in alignment and that's going to come up here too but so i think i get referrals for patients that need insulin um, because their fastings are high yet they're eating cereal at night for a bedtime snack and that to me isn't fair to that patient because if they're probably high because they weren't given good education about dietary interventions that are not harmful to do. It's not harmful to move cereal, right? To not have them eat that. They can move it somewhere else and they can do a different snack that's gonna work better. For so them. start and end your day with protein. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then vegetables, I count for free because that's always the good thing to pick out on, right? And so having that list of the non-starchy vegetables frozen, all the tips that you guys give for eating on a good vegetables on a budget, um, what's in season, um, and helping brainstorm ideas for, for that if they're struggling, and then protein. Um, I would actually like to see this manipulated a little bit more in the GDM plan. Well, I don't know why it's always carbs and fats that get the attention, but I think um, protein is one of those that can be modified a little bit more. But I just basically... I don't have my patients count protein. I just make sure at every meal and snack they're including protein um, so that they meet the daily goal of 71 grams. Over Spread out over six, three meals and three snacks is not difficult if you're making sure to have protein throughout the day. And there's, I think it's kind of subjective, but potential satiety benefits as well. And then you'll, we're gonna look at food order and things like that that are interesting. Um, types of fats, so fats, I think, have been this idea been really being looked at for oh 10 years now um, in pregnant uh, mammals or humans and also um, monkey studies that super interesting high fat diets um, but in general we know fats help make food taste good right some are more uh, healthy for our bodies um, as far as looking at inflammation and insulin sensitivity improving that so that's kind of what we're trying to help with pregnancy <laughs> right is to improve um, like put more fats in our bodies that help that kind of area and also making sure patients have a source of DHA and EPA in their diet is always a good time, you know, especially in that third trimester or late second trimester when you're seeing them for GDM, making sure that's consistent. Sometimes they're, they like it, but they kind of fall off the wagon and aren't doing it as consistently. So it's an opportunity to talk about that again, um, what they use for cooking um, and you know, nobody needs to avoid saturated fats. That'd be impossible, right? But primarily the fats in the diet should be from plants and unsaturated sources is a goal. And if somebody's having excess weight gain, 
um, like maybe encouraging eating the fats instead of using a lot of oils and things like that, using eating nuts and avocados if they like. Um, so you guys know the stats on this too, that you know most of the added sugars in our diet are coming from beverages. Um, and so where the pregnant woman compares to so the average is about 19 and a half teaspoons a day. Um, and the recommendations from the Heart Association are the most strict, um, six teaspoons for women. The dietary guidelines encourages no more 10% of total calories, right? So it'd be 10 to 12 teaspoons a day maybe for women. This is a great website if you're just interested in evidence-based sugar science facts. Um, they're the guys that are going to be publishing all of the um, food industry kind of emails and stuff that the t kind of like the tobacco companies were hiding about the known health consequences of their products. Mary and Nestle um, did a talk at Cal US UCSF um, and talking about um, these papers and how she found that she was in the emails too because they were watching her and spying on her. She was traveling around the whole country and in Australia kind of talking about added sugars and food companies and stuff. So it's super interesting, but this is a great way. They have free, all this free educational materials um, that you can post um, places, uh, posters and all sorts of good stuff. So there was a recent study um, that looked at consumption of added sugar in pregnancy and pregnant women were consuming about 15% of their total calories from added sugar. So they too, like everybody else, are over consuming added sugars um, and that intake is associated with excess weight gain in pregnancy and um, larger babies as well. So, you know, it just keeps that message going that we're not picking on you because you have gestational diabetes, but all pregnant women should have a handle on their added sugar intake, you know, being smart consumers, comparing products, buying the ones with the least amount of added sugar, um, and that there's benefits for your baby's body composition and also your gestational rate of gestational weight gain. And it is really hard to meet the goals for blood sugars in pregnancy if you have too much of these types of foods in your diet. And that strategically, you might know a better time to have them if you really want them, which would be in the afternoon. So of course they can be part of a healthy pregnancy diet. Um, and this is a message that, you know, I'm not as in touch with pediatricians as you guys are, but I really am happy that the American Academy of Pediatrics has really come out strongly in the last couple of years about, um, you know, when is it appropriate to add juice in the diet for kids and add how much added sugar should kids have um, so that I can use that as further messaging that, again, this is stuff that you're going to be parents to be. It starts with, yes, growing your baby's body as healthy as possible, and then your next job is to teach your your baby or kid how to take care of that body so partners you know getting the partners involved with their habits what habits they have that are working for them or not um, and that pretty much women and children are encouraged to eat the same amount of added sugar no more than six teaspoons a day um, so which can be challenging but worth you know striving towards and and using that added sugar and even fats to make the good stuff taste better right that that's a goal too um, so where do we stand with GDM diet? Um, I think you can't go wrong just focusing on high quality um, choices from all the macronutrients, right? Focus on diet quality um, and you can use the glycemic index, but thinking about slow carbs, um, increased fiber, minimize simple sugars, minimize saturated fat, um, and that we continue to need to uh, hopefully look out for high quality studies to, you know, elucidate more about um, different macronutrients too and their effects like fats and, and um, you know, things we can help to, uh, it might not just be about blood sugars, it's probably about lipids too um, and profiles in, in women um, and fatty liver and stuff like that, but we want to improve both mom's and baby's health, right? Um, and hopefully resolve this inconsistency with diet So here's just a couple more um, kind of, I would say, advanced ways of thinking about how to counsel patients about optimizing their blood sugars in pregnancy that have come up. So in the non-pregnant population, if you just work with diabetics, this should definitely be a tool in the toolbox. Talking about how, what order you eat your foods and helping decrease the post-glucose rise in your blood sugars after meals. So um, 
basically encouraging and it's very um, replicable too. I think it's all different ethnicities eat salads, right? Different culturally kind of ways of eating. So eating a salad first, the beginning of your meal, um, helps slow down the rise of blood glucose after you eat. So then you would eat your carbs and your protein after that, or eating just the meal mixed together helps lower post-meal lunchers. My patients really like that idea a lot. Rather than thinking about counting carbs or portions, they just like the idea of, oh, I'm gonna eat a big salad first, you know, and then I'll eat my, you know, sat my potatoes and my chicken and see what happens, you know, with my blood sugars. So that's something that a lot of patients find beneficial for their blood sugars. Also, if somebody really has a hard time not being able to eat rice or potatoes, because that's all they have left. If they can eat half of that portion and then add in lentils or beans, that slows down the carb absorption. So you can have a higher glycemic index carb mixed with a lower glycemic index carb and that can help lower post meal blood sugars. So that's an idea um, that has been shown to be beneficial. Um, and those are, you know, not necessarily from cans, but from scratch, lower, you know, cost, um, good protein sources as well. And then when you eat, so this is, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the term chrononutrition. This was new to me. I was, I always suspected that I, cause I would see a relationship with patients who eat late dinners, which is pretty common these days, nine, eight, nine, 10 PM and higher fastings in the morning. And as I was doing more reading and, and, um, you know, there's a lot more data looking at this idea that, um, our bodies optimally operate when we're eating in tune with our innate circadian rhythm because of all the things that happen with um, our lipids and our blood sugar management and our gut communicating with the liver during the night and other systems that are important as well. And so if we eat out of tune with that. Um, you know, this is why probably night shift workers to have higher rates of developing diabetes, one of the reasons. Um, and also poor sleep. That's also an epidemic we're seeing amongst our women. Um, and that's an issue for sure, um, affecting blood sugars upon waking and stress and things that are a little less within a person's control. But if somebody's eating late dinners and they have high fastings and they're able to, to test out earlier dinners, that's another idea that is often um, helpful for, for their uh, fasting blood sugars. Um, and then, Exercise, of course, has lots of benefits in pregnancy, but specifically um, for blood sugar management, it's a great tool, like free medicine to the body. So we encourage, whenever it works for a person, so all pregnant women are encouraged to get about 30 minutes a day um, of exercise or some kind of activity. Um, but if you eat and directly go for a walk for 10 or 15 minutes, that you get post-meal blood sugar benefits because muscles uptake 25% of glucose that comes from your meal. But also what we're finding um, is that evening exercise, whether it's some cardio or even while you're in the kitchen cooking dinner, waiting for the water to boil or your vegetables to cook, if you do use the counter and do counter squats and wall push-ups and things like weight resistance exercises, um, then that primes the muscles to get ready to uptake glucose and there can be a longer term benefit overnight um, for the fasting blood sugars. And so we don't have studies in pregnant women, but they're in the non-pregnant population, there is definite direct benefits of both cardio and strength resistance training for managing diabetes. And so um, we're actually, um, one of our doctors is proposing a study with our uh, feeding clinic up at OHSU and our phys exercise phys department looking at pregnant women with gestational diabetes and when's the best timing for exercise and what types of exercise. So that's interesting questions, but worth trying out because it's healthy behavior to do in pregnancy anyways. Um, so I've had lots of patients who um, have employed this strategy and had um, kept themselves off medication. So. I don't, do you guys want to look at blood sugars? Is that interesting or we're kind of getting to the end. Maybe we'll all keep on moving, but we have our patients check their blood sugars four times a day. Um, insurance generally is, does a good job about covering. The goal for fastings is below 95. The key is to make sure they're fasting for at least eight hours, no more than 12 hours. Um, and then one hour after each meal. And that should be 
from the beginning of the meal. So starting from their first bite of food. Um, there is no real, this is sort of a made up rule that if they have 20% or more of their fastings above the goal, so we look at those separate because as you now know, that's an independent contributor for macrosomia, then we would employ more lifestyle intervention if possible or medication if they've tried all the things that we know that can help. Um, same with the one hours. If they have like a breakfast pattern of more than 20%, we start them on meal insulin at breakfast or lunch or dinner. Um, here's, I mean, I have lots of patients. Nobody's excited to check their blood sugars. Um, but again, a lot of patients come around to me and like, wow, that glucometer is kind of interesting. It kind of does keep me on track. It gives me extra reasons, right? To, you know, kind of stay with the good choices because pregnancy does serve as a permissible cultural reason to give in more to stuff than people normally would, right? And so we need to give extra reasons like to help them kind of stay on track, hopefully in a, in, without, you know, guilt and things. Um, I think some of the, I do a lot more, ooh, I just have a lot more patients who have a lot of anxiety and depression too, and they're not able to, um, without a lot of reinforcement, look at the results in this non-judgmental, helpful way, or they just, get super stressed out, right, from the data. And so a lot of my, I, I, I do a lot of my charting with blood sugars and um, really supporting patients and on a weekly basis, you know, about how to look at their blood sugars, use it as information, um, you know, in a beneficial kind of way. Um, so I'm gonna keep going here. This is just in case we're looking at. So we, um, Medication that's used widely in pregnancy, so it's it's basically now standard of care that insulin should be the first line agent because it's the only agent that does not cross the placenta. And so patients should be involved. If they say, I really don't want insulin, I just want metformin, of course that's the easier choice, right? But they should be educated and informed that it does cross the placenta, going through the pros and cons and still making sure that that would be their choice. Right? We shouldn't let fear of insulin or things that people might have heard from their, you know, brother or their grandmother or their grandfather, right, help make that decision for them about insulin. Because I would say 99% of my patients who, who are totally freaked out about insulin have no problems doing the injection and say it doesn't hurt. It hurts more to poke your finger than it does to do insulin. And so, I think the key for me is education and informing. Patients deserve to be informed about the pros and cons, about why insulin is recommended as a first line, um, and that 50% of patients who use metformin will require insulin anyways, and then you've wasted time. You've wasted weeks, because often pr providers will prescribe metformin, and they'll be doing like 500 milligrams BID, where the therapeutic dose is actually 2,000 milligrams a day. So they're not even using it correctly to get the maximum benefit. And we, glyburide even was not used correctly. It was supposed, I mean, really to get a therapeutic effect, supposed to be given like 90 minutes prior to a meal, because we would give it to patients, and they would drop in the weirdest times of day and get hypoglycemia. Well because we weren't using it correctly. But then we found out it crosses the placenta and has higher rates of neonatal hypoglycemia, which isn't great because then the baby goes to the NICU. None of our moms want their baby to go to the NICU, right, because of low blood sugar. So that's why we don't use glyburide. Uh, so we will use metformin occasionally, or if they, they're on it already, or if there are huge amounts of insulin, we might use metformin to help with the insulin sensitizer, as long as the woman is, knows about the placental issue. And the offspring who have been exposed to metformin in pregnancy, if you're interested, the, um, the um, MIG trial, they've done a follow-up trial. The Australians really love metformin. Those offspring are fatter than babies who weren't exposed to metformin in pregnancy. And they're like 7 to 11 years old now. So, you know, there's just unknown, right, long-term effects for some of these medications, too, for fetal programming. So these women, as we know, have a higher risk to develop type 2. So to me, this is a huge like opportunity for WIC um, because we don't do a very good job screening, but we do we do a less good job following up and making sure that they're, you know, doing diabetes prevention program type lifestyle behavior so that they don't get diabetes, um, which is a great program for helping women with gestational diabetes not get diabetes. It's great for pre-diabetic patients too, uh, but I see a huge opportunity uh, 
to offer this because communities are where, I mean, this is a 16 week program. It's very intensive, right? So if you offer it in a community, it's gonna be a lot better than on a hill. That's really hard to get to, you know, even for just pregnant women to come to. So I really hope that that gets going. Be totally supportive of that. Um, less than two thirds of women are screened postpartum. Just hard, you have a new baby who wants to think about fasting and going and doing a two hour glucose tolerance test, right? At six or eight weeks postpartum. Um, but, and then they should be followed up at least every three years as well for prediabetes or type two. So education, um, there's, a, there's good you know education, but really it gets down to diet qualities. We've talked about, there's a lot of great healthy eating patterns out there that look at diet quality from all the food groups, right? Cause we should be looking at health, not just pre post, but just this healthy metabolic, right? System where you're putting mostly good stuff in your body. Um, and these are also associated with reduced risk of developing gestational diabetes in pregnancy, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, just a healthy eating plate. Um, and nothing, nothing good comes from food guilt, right? I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and that's what I preach to providers, you know, too, that we have to be uh, more conscious to the fact that there is a lot of, um, you know, Hey, women just don't seem to have confidence or the confidence that they know what to put in their body because there's so much mixed messages out there and so much dieting behaviors, right? I think women either know how to lose weight or to gain weight. And so really encouraging them to help heal their relationship with food and their bodies is super important because offspring of mothers who have a healthier relationship with their bodies and food are healthier themselves. I mean, that's just where the data is. And I love Ellen Satter. She's been around longer than me. She has a great website and trainings. If you want training and helping to build competent eaters, um, eating should be fun experience for the whole family. Um, nutrition is part of that, but it's a part of it, right? It's not everything. Um, and encouraging intuitive eating with kids and so that you know they don't learn some of the things that maybe women are struggling with themselves, hopefully not to pa keep passing that along and that there's a lot of delicious food out there right? For all of us. This is just the, that healthy bowl. But I love the California farmers have great websites for avocado board, olive board, walnut board. Whether you eat those foods or not, just the ideas of the foods are, are great. Anything where you eat with your eyes first, in my mind, is great. And also, I've learned not to sell any patients short, whether they're lower income, higher income, they still might be eating avocados too and eating really delicious stuff, right? You can't judge anybody by their anything because everybody makes me hungry when I talk to them in my clinic because we just like to talk about food. So, <laughs> all right, that's all I got. And then references. So thanks for having me. I wow. appreciate being a reachable person. You learn it too. I haven't thought about infant formulas forever. That brought back some serious <laughs> memories. I'm kind of glad I'm like, whoo, I could probably <laughs> kill some baby off if I made the wrong formula. So, what questions do you have for us? So, um, I'm glad you mentioned Sweet Success because that was one of my questions. Yeah. Um, I know they put their modules online yeah. like, for training. Yeah, they're pretty and, good. And I yeah. wondered, and I did the first one just to see what it yeah. was like, but this isn't my area. And, yeah. You know, I'm just wondering if that is a viable training because they're free. Yeah. Like, Agreed. Yeah. Like, good I think so. I mean, you know, I'm, I. I haven't seen anything better that's been made yet, like module wise, you know, WIC wanted to collaborate, but I mean, it's, it doesn't give you the other side of the story though. It, they're very focused on the lower carb, if you notice. I just did the first one yeah. and I wasn't thinking. Yeah, you're right, it has like four or you know, five. They have four modules yeah. now and they'll put I thought it was okay. I thought it was a little, so, I just wanted yeah. Maybe not as up to date or a little bit kind of boring too in a way. So, but they were all right. Yeah, I think their conferences are better. But again, you have to fly and yeah. pay. And yeah, because they were free. The yeah, no, I think. And now, I mean, if I could look at them, go back and look at them again and see if I thought they were approved would be appropriate. Because you're right. Yeah, being free is a good thing. Yeah. So, to summarize it, if if we can get a better job of just getting the correct risks assigned for our women, um, 
with gestational diabetes so that we reflect what's going on, that we have some opportunities with counseling and using our food list to help support what they're doing and to um, emphasize um, uh, the importance of diet, um, recognizing that insulin does not cross over, so that's an important fact for follow-up. And also that part of between pregnancies, having that education and awareness with a woman who has been diagnosed with gestational diabetes to know that there are much higher risk of type 2 diabetes and how do we look at that, how do we counsel around that so that they go into the next pregnancy yeah. um, with, with better success. We think of the postpartum visit as the pre-conceptual visit if they're planning on having another pregnancy. But half, only half of all women with gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy get it again. That's interesting too, right? So, um, but what's really important, if, if they required insulin or they had a much higher glucose test result or they had earlier in pregnancy, they're at much higher risk. So you could ask them, like, did they require medication? You could kind of help, you know, see if they're in that probably higher risk category versus somebody who's diet controlled. Maybe she's in that other category where, oh, she has 50% chance maybe of not getting it again. But if you see them early in pregnancy, you know, on with WIC, then there is potentially just some modifiable factors that would be easy to employ that might help, right? Them mean not get it again, which I don't think is good. Well, I realize we are over time. Yeah, um, we started late, so I appreciate you. You're right on time. Um, and thank you so much. And um, do you ever do consults by like using um, Skype? Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah, telemedicine? Yeah. Not yet. Okay. But I think it's coming. Okay. I do all of my chart. I do a lot of my charting the blood sugar. So I send patients a message. They take pictures of their logbook and send it to me as an attachment. So that help save visits. Um, that's about as advanced as I am right now, because I don't, but our, some of our doctors do some telemedicine and we're starting to think about that. Okay. Excellent, yeah. That seems like a nice collaboration that would be quick as well. Yeah. So Christy, thank you so My much. My pleasure, thank you again. Thank you. So for those on the phone, we're going to sign off. And just as a reminder, um, we hopefully, fingers crossed, have um, taped, uh, recorded uh, Christy's session. So it will be available to go back and listen to again. Um, you have the PowerPoint slides. Um, and um, for those who miss, um, hopefully you can um, catch it at a later date. Um, hope the weather gets better and that we have sunshine in our future. <laughs> Bye, everybody. I will send out the certificates of attendance as well. All right.